we're really happy to have our colleague Adi Tomer back with us for his second trip to Las Vegas and he's going to talk tonight about two things that we're keenly interested in. One is our built environment and the other is the impact of technology. So you get a two for one tonight <laughs> at no extra charge whatsoever. So Adi is a uh, member of, uh, of the Brookings Institution of the Metropolitan Policy Program and he, his educational background includes a master's degree in public policy from American University and a BA from the University of Florida. So I'm going to invite him up to begin the evening. Thank you, sir. Those lights are really bright. Um, but you don't need to turn them down. I don't mean it like that. I'm just stream of consciousness when I get up here. It's really awkward at the start. Um, how's everyone doing? Really good? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? To Bill's point, everyone warm enough? Is it warm enough in here? Do we need to change the temperature or anything? We're just making it awkward for everyone who's gonna watch this video later. They're gonna be like, what even, when, when was this even filmed? What matters? Um, so again, so, so thanks for the introduction, Bill. It's been great. I'm seeing some of the folks that I've talked to already this week and it's been an awesome week here in Las Vegas because what, what is ironic is my email address is a .edu, but I'm not on a campus. I don't get to see students and talk with them. And honestly, this is some of the most dynamic conversation I've had for, for months, but please don't tell anyone. Uh, so um, it's, it really is engaging for us. So thanks to the Mountain West team uh, for helping to put it together. And honestly, thanks for all the curiosity and creativity we've seen here in Las Vegas, or I've seen in Las Vegas since I've been here. I know I say we because every time folks from at least the Metro program that I talk to a lot come out here, they always come back to DC so enthused. So, um, uh, what I like to, how I kind of like to introduce myself, uh, which is especially appropriate in a place like Las Vegas, and, the, and um, is, is I grew up in Florida. That's why, as Bill mentioned, I, I graduated from the University of Florida. Um, and where I grew up, besides the mountains and the, the arid kind of desert climate, right, um, if you exchange it for full flatness and swampy conditions, you know, it looks a lot like Las Vegas, right? Um, it's a place that really didn't have anyone living there until the car was invented. It certainly wasn't a place you wanted to live before air conditioning existed. Um, but because of that, we've kind of designed the place we lived in in a really, really similar way. So what I'm going to talk a lot about today is how the built environment that we all live in has actually come into being. And, and the reality is not just for Las Vegas or where I grew up, a, a town on the west coast of Florida, but really everything that stretches between Miami and you know, the basin in Los Angeles and Southern California, you know, stretching up to Las Vegas, all through the kind of new south as they call it, the Carolinas and things. It's really weird, it all, all kind of looks the same. And folks often wonder, well, you know, why, why does the built environment look so similar? And that's a lot of the stuff we're gonna talk about today. Um, but where I actually wanna start, and in a lot of what's gonna anchor the conversation today, kind of cycle over everything, is something that I'm passionate about, but my guess is that all of you in, in this room, and certainly the way people are gonna watch this remotely later, right, that you're passionate about too, is digital technology. So um, to help get everyone a little warmed up or whatever, right, I wanna ask you a question. Obviously, folks later can't see you, so I'll kinda summarize what I'm seeing. Um, you know, humor me for a second, don't be embarrassed. Um, how many people in the audience have a smartphone? Yeah, all right, almost 100%. So uh, that's pretty telling. So. Um, I want you to, you don't have to keep your hands up, but I ask another question. How many of you have heard of something called a smart city? Ever heard that phrase before, smart city? Okay, and keep your hands up, keep your hands up, humor me. Okay, it's almost, again, almost everyone's hands up. Please be honest, no one's gonna remember this, no one can see you. How many people, if I asked you what is a smart city and feel confident in the answer, keep your hands up. Do you actually know what a smart city is? Yeah, there we go, ah, all right, so unconfident, I like that. So we've got a couple people, but most people drop their hands. And I think that's telling, right? As, as my amazing wife always likes to say, I love a smart city, what does it mean though, right? Which tells you, number one, the marketing is really, really good. Uh, but it also tells you that there's a lot of opportunity there and a lot of, a lot of gaps, right? And you know, I think that smart cities in a lot of ways, they actually are functionally this, right? So these are some pretty I don't know, I find both of these pictures to be really scary. That's kind of why they're on there, right? So you've got like some anonymous uh, 
um, closed circuit TV for anyone who knows what's going on in London these days and it's been there for years. They basically have the entire fabric of London covered. So if you try to steal anything in London, be scared. They can follow you all throughout the city. Uh, it's because of closed circuit cameras like that. The, those closed circuit cameras though, right, they're digital and they're recording every image and as Artificial intelligence, which I'll touch on a little bit later, learns how to process that stuff. Like, right, like, you know, we're it's in 2019 now. I was about to say 2018. So, for any of you who uses Google Photos, you get that freaky thing where, like, why does it know who a person is, and how did it figure out if I tagged that person in one picture? Now they can track them everywhere, right? It's the same technology powering that stuff to track criminals in London. And on the other side, right, we we've also started to rethink how we uh, put sensors inside buildings, not just watching what's happening outside of it. Um, and this is actually a picture from a very famous building in Beijing. And so really for the folks that have made sure you know what smart cities are as a term, this is what they think a smart city is, right? It's a place that we can track very closely. And I'll get a little bit more into the definition in a second, but I don't know about you, this is not what I think of as a city. That's, that's a city to me. I mean, look at how awesome that is. First of all, take yourself back to that age. That kid is running through a sprinkler. He's having the time of his life. At least it looks that way to me. And more importantly, it's, it's human, right? Isn't that the difference? There's a person on this screen, right? And next time you watch a smart city commercial, I want you to think about how often do you actually see people in those pictures? Whoa, what just happened? Oh no, talk about. They tapped us, dude. <laughs> uh, anyway, so to me, this is, this is what a smart city is really all about. How, how, do we make, how do we make places that people want to live? So, you know, to me, these are the pictures especially. So uh, I was born in 1981, so I'm right on the border of a millennial. My, my hair says no, my, my baby cheeks say yes. Um, and for people in my generation and younger, this starts to be the characterization of what we think cities and communities are gonna look like, you know? They're, they have a lot of, especially as we see on the left, uh, they have, they're a lot more social, right? They put us together, you know, on the, on the kind of the, the, the two black and white pictures, right? It's, it's people think about that, kind of living closer together and, and really amplified in the top right there, um, people actually living in denser settings. Now, everyone's not gonna do this, and I'm not suggesting they should, but in many ways, this is, kind of the image of modern metropolis. What I want to push you to think about too, I'm going to talk a lot about marketing today in different kind of offhanded ways because uh, I think it matters a lot here. Um, next time you watch a TV commercial for a car, notice how often now they're driving through cities, not driving through suburbs and not driving through rural areas unless they're pickup truck commercials, in which case they're often moving some heavy stuff. Now, here's the thing though, right? Uh, does anyone think this really looks like America that we live in today? This is America. Now think about that difference, right? That's a stark, stark difference in the capital investment, right? How much, how much money and, and physical construction we poured into that. Um, it certainly doesn't look, well those houses are close together, but it certainly doesn't look like many people are walking. I'm not even sure if there's really sidewalks there. And then in the top picture, I mean, forget about it, right? You better have a car. So what we gotta do is we gotta square all this, right? We want to build places that work for people. We're thinking about technologies that in some ways are, are meant to be kind of person-less, right? In some ways even soulless, right? And we want to build, build a built environment, right? That kind of puts us all closer together and kind of maybe feels a little bit more like we're connected, but we're kind of stuck with a model um, that, we, uh, that we built a long time ago and we're going to have to kind of keep making it work. And, and by the way, people actually still demand a lot of that too. So, this is kind of what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about what's happening in the world uh, from an economic perspective. Why, how are we kind of figuring out which places are going to be competitive? How, how are we going to grow in the future? Uh, then I want to kind of turn in a much bigger kind of the, the kind of big meat of the presentation. I want to talk about what does technology mean from a built environment perspective as opportunities for us and hopefully a lot of that stuff that resonates right away. And then maybe what are some of the threats that some of you aren't thinking about yet as we all, again, most of us have smartphones in this room right now and we're all digitally connected. Hopefully most of us are digitally fluent. Um, but what are some of the challenges around such a digital economy that we're building? Uh, and then finally, what can government do about it, all this? How can we build more places that look like that really, really happy kid running through the, the sprinkler and less like maybe that soulless uh, camera that's probably going to be tracking us anyways, but at least we notice we think we're having a little bit more fun than just cameras watching us. 
Okay, so let's jump in. So how, why? Let me ask you a kind of existential question, right? If it makes sense. This is what urban economists think about all the time. Um, you know, why do places exist? Why, why is Las Vegas here, right? Really? Like, why is New York where it is, right? Why is London or Rome or Shanghai or, or Baghdad? Why are those places there, right? Well, economists think it really comes down to kind of two things, right, um, on this page, on this screen. And it used to really just be the one on the left, specifically what the gentleman's holding. Um, you've got to be able to sell something to someone else, right? A place exists because people make goods and services and they want to be in the same place. Uh, and they can sell those goods and services to someone else and they can make a profit and off of that profit they can bring it back to their community, right? And that cycles all around, right? So, you know, our traditional economies are about selling goods and services. Now we know in the digital century, and this is why, I mean, for any of you who live in, in either apartment buildings or, or, or have kind of just seen like a New York, it, next time you go to, if any of you are in New York, check in, look inside an apartment building for maybe a friend or family who lives there and watch the stack of Amazon boxes building up as people refuse to even just walk down the street for shopping, right? You know, this is how we move goods around, right? It's the same as it was before. It's the same idea folks like Jane Jacobs have talked about, you know, for, in her case, almost 100 years now, um, about why places exist, because they make goods and services that people want. But how we move those goods matters very, very differently. And of course, right here in Las Vegas, right, you know, you can't honestly, and it's not just because I'm here today, you can't think of a more important market in the country where the sale of services really powers why people are here. And I was talking to a, a student earlier today and the idea, right, of I think if you're born and raised here, you, it's implanted in your head, right? The idea that come to Las Vegas, do what you want, just leave your money, right? And that's selling services, right? And you're selling a good time, and Las Vegas is really good at it, and it's why the, ever the hospitality is, it's the actual hospitality, not capital H, right? The, the hospi ho hospitableness, if you will, of folks is so good here. So anyways, this is why places exist, and it's changing in the digital century, right? How you sell goods and services looks really different. Now, what we also know is because digital indi uh, industries are changing, how we trade goods and services, what even goods and services we're selling, what's demanding of our workforce is changing too. So this is research by my colleague Mark Muro out of the Brookings Metro program. And what you're seeing on the screen is basically the idea of how much do you know how to use a computer and other digital equipment and how much is that required in your job? And I want you to notice something here. 2002 to 2016, for some of you in the audience or some of you watching this might be like, I was, I was in elementary school when that happened, right? But in terms of the labor market, that is quick change. And you're talking about over 50% of people barely had to know or even use digital equipment. 2002, and then 14 years later, they're only 30% of the population? That's incredible, right? So if you ever wonder why it matters so much to have things like, you'll see these terms or keep hearing me say them, digital fluency. The idea of you pick up a, a, a smartphone or frankly you just sit down in front of a keyboard and you know how to use it, that's what defines competitiveness for workers uh, in this digital century. And if you don't have those skills, imagine how do you find a job? You know, I heard a story a few years ago that just blew my mind. The idea that when you need to apply for a job at McDonald's, maybe the quintessential kind of starting entry level, frankly, minimum wage job in America. Today, you need to apply online. Think about all the skills you need to have to do that. You need to build a resume online. You need to know how to use the internet. You need to then know how to email and check your email. Again, for those of us born, uh, you know, millennials and younger, right? We can't even, that's like walking, right? We just know how to do it. But imagine if you grew up in a world where you didn't know those skills, right? It's changing fast. What's also changing fast, and as, as Bill has you know, really done some great education for me while I've been here, right, because Las Vegas is the future, we're, we're living it here, right, is the color and age of our country is changing. You know, I would argue for the better, but this is really important stuff to think about, right, that we're a different kind of country, and, and the demands of what we'll need in this century are changing, right? So what's the importance of medicine, and where are we gonna have to deliver that medicine, right? How are we going to be uh, tolerant of different cultures and things? And that'll come up a little bit more in the, uh, in the presentation too. This is data from my colleague Bill Fry, who's pretty much the country's leader, leading demographer. Really, really amazing guy. So what I also want to talk about is something that folks, again, in my generation and younger are especially sensitive to, which is the idea that our planet is climate is changing. 
in very, very scary ways. At the time that we're having this talk today, right, there's new, fresh news that a glacier um, in Antarctica is going to, looking like it's potentially going to be breaking off from the shelf faster than expected, could raise sea levels significantly in much shorter time than we expected, right? Um, I have three little kids. I'm not going to have any more kids, so no matter if this is watched in 10 years, I have three kids. That's the max. Uh, and I'm scared when I look at them, you know? And you know, what you're seeing on this screen is the amount of payout in premiums due to just, just certain extreme events, right? I mean, you can't ignore the change that's happening there, right? I mean, it's staring you in the face. And this is just premiums collected on things like hurricanes, which are, again, right, as a Floridian, I'm pretty sensitive to, right? How do you calculate the fact that transportation is now our number one polluting sector in the country? First time in recorded history which means like you know last hundred years or so that we're basically able to capture data so every time you turn the ignition on in your car you're basically slowly slowly warming up the planet just to get where you want to go and it's scary but it's especially scary as we'll talk more about that sometimes you don't feel like you have any choice but turn turn on the ignition in your car to get to where you need to go so this is las vegas across about 30 years and i love this video i'm going to play it even more than the three times it's going to play 30 years you got, everyone want to see it again? Yeah. It's great, right? I mean, it's just, it's just like good to have videos. You know, it breaks it up. This is the only one I got. I'm sorry. Look at that outward growth. So that's sprawl. If anyone, you know, I showed you aerial pictures of it before. That's what it looks like when it happens for real. Again? Everyone want again? <laughs> yeah. All right. Come on. It's, that's cool. It's um, unbelievable. There's, I was talking to Bill about it since I've been out here. There's no other place in the country you can really see it happen this fast. Um, and um, by the way, these are, these are, it's in the bottom right corner. These are Google videos. You can go to any city pretty much in the country and load up these time lapse videos of how development has changed in the past like 30 or 40 years. So it's a pretty cool way to see how our development choices have changed the built environment. Um, and you know, the reality is that's what we've got to grapple with, right? It's a lot further distances for people to travel. You know, one of the, my favorite stats uh, in my field of, of, that I study all the time is the no, most common commute in America is from one suburb to another suburb, right? So that idea that we kind of grow up with the idea for, um, uh, you know, for like older East Coast markets in the United States, oh, people take trains into downtown and that's, that's kind of how cities operate at scale. That's not true at all anymore. Most people live in a suburban single family home. They work in a suburban office park or a suburban retail strip mall, right? And they have to travel between it. And it's really, really hard to make any kind of transportation work in a place like that that's not an automobile. So in the digital century, you know, as ironic as it is that, you know, for all the contentious stuff on social media and things of that nature that I'm not an expert in, but the reality is all this technology that really does bring us closer together, maybe closer sometimes than we want to be to certain people. You know, I don't know, want to know what you ate earlier that day, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, for all that closeness, we actually keep getting physically further from each other, which is, I don't know. I, I'm not sure exactly why we're doing it. Um, you know, I have some ideas I'll talk about a little bit more, but I think addressing this, knowing that we're slowly, slowly destroying the planet ourselves, that we're trying to think about how we can exchange more goods and services, how we can help make, educate more people, especially in digital skills. I'm not sure if this map is a recipe for success. And the last point I want to make in this section is to talk a little bit more about how we're going to build our way out. And to be clear, when I say build our way out, whether build up, build out more, whatever it's going to be, the reality is the building that's going to happen in the country happens most of the part, in, for most of the, the time from local resources. So there's an idea, um, no matter you know, what time of year, what year it is, there's always a, an infrastructure debate in Washington. And I'm not going to really talk about Washington almost at all in this presentation, even though I, I work there. Um, but the reality is there isn't much of an infrastructure platform out of the federal government in terms of leadership of the country. Most infrastructure decisions, as you're seeing on this chart, are actually paid for by state and local government. Um, and often it, the federal government's there to either incentivize or top up state and local investment. So as we talk a little bit more today um, over the remaining time about what is happening in terms of construction in the country, um, it's actually what's really cool is that you can decide a, a lot of those things locally, right? 
whether it's working with folks um, in the north of this state or just you know when, when the authority is here in the southern portion of the state. So in that, I, I find that to be an affirmative message across the country, right? You don't need to wait for Washington, right? If you want to rebuild your community, all those decisions start right here at home. Okay, so let's get to the meat. What, <laughs> and start to answer that first question. What is a smart city, okay? So a smart city uh, is a municipality that uses information and communication technologies to enhance the quality and operation of urban services. Okay, what, what, the, what does that even mean, right? So basically the idea, I don't have my, my, my phone on me, but if I like held it up right now like a prop, right? Basically that thing is just one big sensor sending out signals, right? And then it receives them back. And the idea is that by having those sensors and those signals sending out all that information, right? What's the temperature in the building, right? What time of day is it exactly? Do I need to handle shade, turn up or down the HVAC system, right? That's what sensors in the building can do. Or how about, hey, I'm driving this way. You know, it would be really cool if there's an application on my phone that would tell me if there's traffic coming up, right? Well, of course, folks in Israel invented Waze, right? And now most of us load up Waze, and you're frankly seeing Waze data in Google Maps anyways, right? It tells you, hey, you can avoid the congestion on that road, right? All of that is made possible by sensors. So what does that look like in practice? Well, one of the reasons we love sensors so much is they're really, really easy to deploy. So for those of you um, who are probably pretty well aware of this, it's a lot cheaper to build a sensor than it would be to like build a whole new building, right? And that's even cheaper than it would be to rebuild an entire street, right? So the business community loves sensors, right? It gives them the data and they're cheap. So if you ever wonder why you're getting deluged with smart city advertising, it's because they want to sell some smart city sensors. It helps them sell other services too. Um, and it helps to manage a lot of data, which I'm gonna get to in a second. So what we are seeing as sensors already start to enter our world, and again, remember, these digital telecommunications, they are brand new. Most of us probably here today or watching are still just old enough, at least, to remember that it wasn't always that people had certainly smartphones and in some cases even cell phones on them, right? So sensors digitally sending out information, I mean, we used to all live in a purely analog world. Digital, <laughs> digital technology was like an alarm clock with like red numbers with those like weird, you know, like ways they would build all the same numbers. You know, that's what digital was. This is all new, and we are quickly seeing changing habits across the country, right? So, I mean, 28% of people 18 to 49 have used a ride hailing app, which for, for young people might sound really low. And honestly, someone watching this in like five years might be like, what? How is that not 100%? But I, just, I mean, everyone can remember when Uber was launched, right? Even if you didn't get a chance to use it. I'm going to get in the back of a stranger's car, really? And now you're like, I'm definitely getting back in a stranger's car <laughs> if I don't have to drive myself. Um, I, the second one I find even more um, amazing, though, actually, right? I mean, Americans did not like bicycles for a long time, right? And they don't work well in those kind of sprawling pictures that I was showing you, right? Whether it was LA or the actual still of like a big highway. But it turns out Americans do like to ride bicycles. What they don't like, though, necessarily is to own their own bicycle. So if I can borrow a bicycle, I really like that, which honestly, I, I didn't think was gonna happen at all. But those bike share systems, they're all based on sensors, right? They need to know where the bikes are, how they readjust them. So for, I know that it's not here in Las Vegas, I think at this time, but if you go to really almost any other larger city, you'll see these bike share systems, especially on the coast. See these bike share systems, if you look at night, you'll see all these vans going around loading up the bicycles to put them back at the stations, which they also have sensors on to know where that tends to be where people want to start their journeys in the morning, right? So it's a really, really cool system. And of course, you know, what we know is that people are working more and more at home. In fact, the fastest growing commuting mode, so like train, car, carpool, whatever, in America is working from home. And all of that is made possible by digital telecommunications. Now, of course, those transportation innovations feel like nothing next to the autonomous vehicle, right? Which is what we're all hearing so much about. And, but there's two things I want to talk to you about, about an autonomous vehicle, which you know, hopefully we can maybe have some questions or answers about at the end. It's kind of hard to box in conversation about this. But in the end of the day, there, these two things that I think really matters. Number one is the transportation workforce is enormous. 9.5 million people work in either the manufacturing of vehicles, the maintenance of vehicles, or the governance of vehicles. So these are people who plan and design roads, right? Or, or think about it like a, like a crossing guard, right? 
So that's a lot of people, and they're all going to have to adjust to a world where we're going to have a lot more autonomy in our vehicles. Now, the other thing that really matters on these cars is that I think we tend to think that autonomous vehicles are going to make trips so much more efficient. None of us are going to own cars. We're all going to sit back and watch probably still Netflix in 30 years. They're pretty market dominant. Um, and uh, life is going to be great. But I'm not so sure what our business model is going to be. I'm not so sure that we're all going to necessarily want to be in cars either. Um, so for but maybe the most important point as, as the leader of Waymo, which is Google or Alphabet's uh, um, uh, autonomous vehicle division, said really just about a month ago, so this is in late 2018, um, he, uh, he said, I'm not sure if we're ever going to have full autonomy in vehicles. So think about that for a second, right? You know, I know there's some autonomous vehicles driving around Vegas. The biggest testing ground is, is a little bit further south, right, in suburban Phoenix. And they're saying right now, I'm not actually sure if we're going to get them. So don't bet your lot on having these fully autonomous cars. I'm, I'm not sure when they're actually going to arrive. Now, the other side of digital, digital telecommunications that's changing our market, as I said in the very first slide about the, uh, uh, or about the trade, is that e-commerce is just dominating how we shop. So what this chart is showing you is annual sales growth, right? So it's, it's really, it should almost be like separate bar charts, right? And what you can see is that even though retail sales have been going up anywhere from about 2 to 4, sometimes even 5% per year, e-commerce, even during the, dip, the depths of the Great Recession, uh, is growing at sometimes 30% per year, right? So what does that mean? Well, we know that right now e-commerce consumes somewhere between 10 and 12% of all business to consumer sales. So that means not between businesses, but actually you and, you and I shopping, right, for our own stuff. Now, less than 10 years ago, though, that's, that share was about at 0%. So it is actually going up logarithmically, right? The curve is off the charts. And we don't know where this stops, actually. You know, is it, I mean, are we all going to just start having, like, a, um, you know, food delivery to our house? Like, for anyone who listens to podcasts, I feel like that's all I'm getting is advertising for food delivery to my house, you know? Um, I don't know if that's where it's going. But it's, it's a pretty incredible change. And again, all of it is made possible by this technology. We also know that there's incredible potential to change our buildings, right? I, I touched on this a little bit. Um, you can see actual saving of the planet just by better monitoring um, both the energy and the water we consume in our buildings. These are, these are really promising and optimistic statistics. And, and I think they're probably right. In fact, I think they might be conservative. Um, and then, you know, we can also reduce our waste. And, and maybe, you know, this might be the, the, the most important innovation of all for, for us just as pure people uh, is, you know, we can help make sure we get better health care outcomes, especially in rural parts of the country that right now don't have access to, to medical professionals. So digital technology is offering us so, so much. And what really powers it in the end of the day is that we are creating data so much faster than we ever imagined possible. So <laughs> the expectation is that we will be creating 300 times more data effectively per day in 2020 than we were in 2005. And there was a recent statistic that the data created in a single set of years will surpass all of the data created in human history prior to it. So every time you're like, not, not literally checking in on like a social media style app, but like every time your phone is pinging where you are, right? That's data that's being created. It has to be stored somewhere. And it is just causing <laughs> massive demands on how we actually manage our built environment. So that to me is, these are the, these are the opportunities that, that digital technology is providing. It is so much of it is both foundational to the built environment, right? Digital telecommunications, the telecommunications is infrastructure, right? Everything we do digital, is all based on infrastructure investments in the end of the day. It's pretty cool to think about. Uh, and at the same time, it's actually changing how we use the built environment too, right? It's changing how we get around, changing how we get healthcare services. But all is not so rosy. So let's go back to what, where I kind of, my first question, right? How many people have a smartphone, right? And almost everyone raised their hands, right? Well, someone's not in this room, right? Because a third of Americans do not have smartphones. So, you know, you order Uber, Lyft, no problem, right? I order food to my house. That's how I do things, right? A third of people can't do that. So if we think Uber and Lyft are going to take over the country, 
Not until that number gets up to 100%, right? It's a challenge, it's a real problem. You wanna do mobile banking, that makes your life easier? That's not something that's available to everyone. I hate that number. Not because I think smartphones are the best thing ever, but the idea that we're gonna build everything we do in our services and our economy around the smartphone, right? Is that what we're being blasted with? And it's gonna leave out potentially a third of Americans? That is a recipe for inequality. Now, we know that inequality is already happening because on the left side, I want to explain what this number means. We did some research on this. So this isn't where broadband goes. This is wired broadband. You know, so for those of you, I don't know what the service here is in Las Vegas, but CenturyLink, Comcast, I mean, you know these names, right? So whoever provides broadband in your home, what we found out by looking not where the cables go, but by who actually subscribes to it, 70 plus million people live in neighborhoods where adoption rates are below 40%. These are entire school districts where a majority of kids live in a house without a broadband connection. Has anyone, I'll just look for nods or something like that, you don't need to raise your hands or anything. Did anyone see this story in the New York Times about a year or two ago about kids sitting outside of McDonald's on their smartphones to download their homework to be able to do it and then they had to come all the way back to upload it? Anyone seen this? I mean, think about that for a second. They're going to a McDonald's Right, which I referenced er earlier conveniently. So to even get a job at, you had to know how to work online, right? Kids are going there to download their homework, to be able to submit it, to not fall behind, to try to keep up in a digital century. These are some of the single scariest numbers you can think about in our world right now. We have to get the number on the left to zero. We gotta get the number on the right to 100%. This is a real national challenge. And we know that market forces alone aren't gonna do it. Now, e-commerce, right? Well, I started with that New York image, right? All those stacks of boxes coming up, right? I'm sure everyone in this room uses e-commerce whenever they can, everyone has a smartphone, right? Um, but it turns out that e-commerce actually isn't creating density. So this is where, um, where e-commerce establishments are. So this is actual warehousing or, or folks like a home shopping network's headquarters, right? And it turns out most of them are more than 10 miles from their central business district. So back to that Las Vegas map, everything sprawling out. What we were seeing happen there wasn't just people, it was businesses too, right? And they're moving further and further apart from each other. So e-commerce is great, it's convenient, but it's not bringing us any closer together, right? And bringing us closer together is important, right? Because that's what seems to be people are voting for often with their feet. Now this might be just as scary of a chart. What this is showing you by the five bars are the quintiles of American households by income. So this is 20% of households, 20% of households, right? We're talking tens of millions in each group. And what the chart is showing you is the, the, the share of their income that they need to spend on housing on the bottom, solo transportation or vehicles on the top, and other infrastructure in the middle. And what is happening on the left, this is a hard chart to explain, and, in, and that, that's really messed up too because this is unbelievably sad. Folks in the lowest quintile, tens of millions of households, roughly about 60 million, uh, not 60 million people kind of are in that. I'm not sure the exact household count. Um, they are underwater the second they pay their rent, the second they pay for their car, the second they pay their water bill, right? They do not have money for food. That's all because of the built environment. And I don't know what we do about it, but we gotta make sure things are more affordable because it's putting people in a financial hole, right? Now, the other part of this, especially because we're in a university setting, right? Folks, you're set up to be in those higher quintiles, which is great. And you can see if you either grew up in those or you see your, your path going there, you know, I live in those, I'll be honest. Built environment doesn't feel like a problem at all, right? Well, I got tons of money left, right? That is inequality in America, right, from a built environment perspective. Now the other side, I kind of finished that last opportunity thing with all the data, right? What do we do with the data, right? Well, it turns out government is really ill-prepared to manage this data. Um, we did a report, uh, this is based on a report my colleague and I did about a year ago, um, and it was really about managing transportation and land use data. And what we were going about to do was we wanted to know how we could get all that sensor data to better understand how people are moving in our built environment. And it's a project we're gonna do anyways. But by the time we started interviewing local governments about how they're managing all that data, before we knew it, we had a new project on our hands. And it was actually categorizing all the ways they didn't know how to manage the data. 
So think about this, they don't know how to collect the data. They don't know how once they get data from let's say like an Uber and Lyft of where everyone's going, they're not even sure what to do with it. Like if it, is it real? How many, how many trips does this totally represent of our community, right? Do 5% do of people take Uber? Do 10%? They don't, they don't know. They don't, they're not prepared on software analytics. They don't have the database chops to put them together. They have a procurement model that tells them they always need to buy just fixed amounts of data, not subscribe to data feeds. So it's kind of like the Netflixization, if you will, of data feeds. They're not ready for it. But maybe the most important on the bottom right corner is they, to a person, told us they cannot recruit the people that will solve the other five problems, right? So I don't know if anyone in the room or, or listening to this is a computer science major, right? But you know, if you were if you were a computer science major and you felt like you were set up to go make right away, you know, in 2019, 150 thousand dollars in Silicon Valley, or could I interest you in a 35 thousand dollar job in local government? And by the way, there's going to be a whole bunch of restrictions on your your career. Would you take the local government job, right? But that's what we're competing with, right? We want government to better manage our data. We want them to protect us. But how do they recruit people to do it? So in many ways, what I think we're kind of left with, though, that, that matters the most to me is that we also have an investment model that's not aligned with what we want to do. So this just isn't about technology, but it, it relates to the last slide. So the, all this data is out there, all this stuff that will help us better understand the built environment. But in many ways, we don't know how to connect what we currently build, like big old road projects, to where a lot of us actually want to live, right? And something that we can afford, something that leaves us good money. Ideally, it gives us choice, especially for lower income households, right? So they don't have to take on those crazy high costs of owning and maintaining a car. Um, so we don't know how to connect these. So to use some kind of like, digital technology parlance, things don't equal. For anyone who ever has to write any kind of code, this is, means does not equal. It's not like some like, 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 <laughs> like future like Reddit thread of like <laughs> some weird community or something. It's, I'm not like sending messages here. It just means does not equal, right? Too much of what we're doing in terms of what kind of world we're building and how the technology connects to it does not actually build a better world for all of us, right? We're not helping that kid run through the sprinkler and be happy, right? Too much of what we're building works for too few. We continue to build infrastructure that pushes us further from each other, that actually is ruining our planet. And what we're being promised is autonomous vehicles that actually might just incentivize us to move even further apart so we can watch movies because I really want to finish the program before I get out of my car, right? So there's a lot of problems here. Digital technology is not going to solve everything for us. So that leads to me, for me at least, to the third part. We need to upgrade governance. We need to build places that better integrate technology. How do we do that in a way that works for everyone? Well, here's what we know. Back to where I kind of started. I, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about the feds again, but I, I kind of am. Um, trust in government is changing rapidly. Remember that digitalization chart of how skills are changing? This is basically the same time horizon. In 13 years, we went from trust in government, again, this, this is Gallup, right? Like Gallup does this stuff. This is not like some hack like chart we found, you know? Um, we use this all over the place, people from Brookings Metro. Um, it works in almost every presentation, right? So 60% of people had trust in federal government, whether the executive branch or Congress. Look at what happens in 13 years, right? Total distrust in what Washington's gonna do. But look at that darker green line on the top. People have more faith in government today at the local level, right? Their mayors, their county commissioners, their school boards, whatever it might be, and for whatever the challenges might be in here, they consistently find them more responsive to their problems. We know the solutions to all this is gonna come from local governments, which means, again, we all have an opportunity to make things better. But I would posit this. The way to build physically a better community is not actually to start with what we're going to build. If the first thing you think is the solution to our problems is more roads, or more buses, or more trains, or more bike lanes, or whatever, you have already lost. Because you're thinking about the technology first. Technology is a tool. 
Technology makes good on what we want it to do. And if we don't tell it to do anything, it will run wild on its own, right? That's how you get highway lane miles and wide roadways far out into the fringes of metropolitan areas. That's how the, th the term, not just suburb, but exurb becomes invented, right? Is by letting technology run wild. So we need to flip how we think about building our communities. We can't start with the technology. We have to start with us, right? What do we want to build? How do our communities represent us? So I would argue that we need to start thinking about places, the built environment, through lenses like this. How do we make our businesses more competitive? What's gonna help Las Vegas innovate around the next evolution of hospitality services or data centers or whatever it might be that you think you can make that's going to be sold to the world, right? And then what infrastructure do they need to be competitive? Do they need super, super high speed internet, right? which in this case would be more fiber everywhere, right? Or is it actually that they need a better digital workforce in the middle, right? And digital training isn't good enough, right? It's about competition for both industrial growth, it's about competition for talent. But also on the people tip to stay in that middle, how do we make sure that people can afford to live and have a high quality of life? If you're donating all your money to your rent and your car and your water bill, that doesn't sound like a good life to me, right? So how do we make the built environment protect our wallets rather than drown our wallets, right? Then finally, on the, on the right side there, what kind of places do we want to build? I'm going to talk in, a, in the next slide here an example of how we think we can get around this. But um, I want to talk uh, what that, where that work took place was in Portland, Oregon. And for anyone who's spent time in Portland, Oregon, they can tell you that's the example. It's right here. I mean, you're in the right time zone for it, actually. On the East Coast, Portland's like some fantasy place for us. But for you guys, you can get to it pretty easy. Um, you know, Portland, decades ago, decided that they didn't like their growth patterns. They wanted to change them. And they wanted to build what they called quality places. Now, what, what do quality places look like? For Portland, 30 to 40 years ago, they looked like that third slide I put up, right? people walking in denser corridors, more, more community centers, right, if you will. And when I say not literal community centers, like a skate park, right, or an ice skating rink, right, places where we could come together to have fun together, to bump into each other, to get to know one each other a little bit more, right, be a little more tolerant from that. 30, 40 years ago they came up with that. And they came up with different tools to help build those kind of places. So that's why when you go to Portland now, you see light rail from the airport, or you see streetcars, right, more bike lanes. It wasn't to build bike lanes. That wasn't their goal. Their goal was to get more people out of, out of cars onto bikes so they'd be more interested in closer, closer destinations, right? So it was about people, not the middle, just like people, like us, what we want, right? Not, hey, what's going to be good for my car, right? That's not how they thought about it. Now, the next evolution, though, of thinking in Portland is something like this, which we, um, this is kind of like a shameless plug, but we've helped develop this tool for them we call an economic value atlas. And what this does is it's meant to interject information into the built environment kind of policy making apparatus on, um, on what informs our decision making. So does anyone, does anyone know how, how highway widenings happen in the country? Yeah, exactly, right? I don't know, they just started doing it, right? And they told us they were gonna do it and there's some money for it. And that's in some ways by design, right? There's not a lot of accountability in those decisions, right? So what we've tried to do here is bring in fields, as you can see, business people place, right? Ideas of how many jobs can people get to by other transportation modes? Can you get to jobs by bicycles or walking? They wanna know by neighborhood level. How about where is gentrification happening? Especially in, in the inner core of Portland where it's becoming even more unaffordable to live. How can we flag the, the neighbors where that's happening the quickest and start to think about other interventions? Maybe not transportation, maybe it's more affordable housing, right? That helps people stay where they already are. I promise you it may not look like this, but this is the next evolution of how we design places, right? More purpose. Second part we got to be more thoughtful about how governance <laughs> manages all this data, right? And what even we expect from our governments. So data management, I kind of went through that already. I mean, we're not even remotely ready inside government. But I want to focus more on the, the, the second and third one. So testing pilots, right? Too often, 
in the country, we, we think that we don't want government to take any chances. We want them to be as risk averse as possible. And this famous Reagan, Ronald Re President Ronald Reagan quote goes through my mind all the time and I hate it. This idea of that government is the problem, right? That government needs to get out of the way. And it doesn't make any sense to me because we are the government, right? It's our company, right? It works for us. And what we know is with the velocity of data, with how fast innovation's happening, we need government to keep up with the private sector, right? So we need them to be more innovative. Mm -hmm. What does innovation mean? Innovation means failure, right? The classic Thomas Edison tinkering in his lab, right? And there's all the failures until he discovers, right, the product that does work, right? So we need to be willing to see how our governments can test out new ideas, let them fail. Don't think that means they're a bad company. It means they're a good company. It means they're trying to find the next solution. And then on the, on the last bit is we need to be more thoughtful about how we get talented people inside the government, right? And not just the, you know, the, the example I gave on hiring people from Silicon Valley, finding some way to recruit them against that you know, financial monster over there on the, on, on the West Coast. But also back to that number I put up about, about transportation workforce, right? 9.5 million people need to be trained to handle all the transportation technologies we're gonna come from. Well, where are those people gonna be trained? They're gonna be trained in places like this, like UNLV, right? Is the engineering curriculum ready for that kind of digitalization? How about our community colleges? How about our K through 12 education, right? Is there a shop, like take a shop class? What's the modern shop class that can help prepare people to be not just an auto mechanic, but an auto mechanic for autonomous digital vehicles, right? That's the kind of thinking we need to have ready. So what I wanna leave you with on this one is a really, really, really cool example. I said this in one, of the, one class when I was here and I can tell this story all the time. People hear a lot about the idea of big data and big data just really means how do we manage all that data velocity and find something that works for it. Well, in Chicago, they recognized they had a challenge. They have a large uh, um, uh, undocumented immigrant population, primarily from Mexico, and Chicago wants to protect them. At the same time, they know those undocumented in, in, uh, immigrants tend to have lower incomes, right? So they're, they, there's threats for them in many ways. But because of their lo relatively lower incomes, they tend to take public transportation more than most. They're also trying to um, uh, kind of change what their relationship is to society. They're trying to adopt American culture faster. They're also trying to put their children onto a more successful path. So they are heavy users of the library system, right? So they're using public transportation a lot. They're using the library system. But those people are scared to be registered, right, in other systems. So what did Chicago came up with? They realized that the same technology that, uses, that powers Bitcoin, Bitcoin, right? <laughs> it's really just encryption and anonymization. They could use the same thing to make sure that the travel cards for the CTA, the Chicago Transportation Authority, also could handle libraries and everything was anonymous. So immigrant families in Chicago could take the train, they could go to the library, and they didn't have to be fearful that they'd have to potentially leave the country, right? That's big data for public good, right? And more innovations like that are gonna happen if we can upgrade the workforce inside government and if we can let them test things, right? We need to test new ideas. Now, I'm not suggesting that that attitude is right for every market, but that reflected Chicago's values through their programming, right? And that's good governance. And so truly the final point, and thank you for sitting so patiently through this whole talk, um, is we need to think about how we design our places and, and what, what goes into that, right? This is kind of where I ended the last section, but I wanna kind of in some ways talk, kind of put a little bit more meat on the bones. These are the drivers to me of what's gonna happen. What's gonna determine what the next 20 years of places like Las Vegas looks like, right? The climate is changing in dramatic and scary ways, right? How are we gonna manage that change? Especially as we get more and more serious about the fuel sources that go into every part of our daily lives. Second is we know that the geometry of place is getting wider, but the amount of space that cars takes up are not getting much smaller, right? So how do we fit all these cars in the same place? As I've been talking to a lot of people since I've been here in this part of the country, right? You don't need to look far to know how much your geometry can break. You can look south to Phoenix to see what the continuization of sprawl looks like, or frankly, you can then go all the way to the coast from there 
and look at the basin of Los Angeles and extending out of what utter total gridlock looks like when you try to put that many people with cars in the same place. The geometry doesn't work, right? And that's because all Phoenix and LA for the most part have tried to do is go out. Out will not solve all our problems. We have to go up. So the question is how and where, right? And then the third part, and this is actually the hardest part from the political economy perspective. It is too cheap to drive in America. You do not have to think about turning on your car. You don't have to think about the pollution either, but you definitely don't have to think about the price. I don't know about you, when I turn on my car and I see that gas meter is at like three quarters, I'm like, I'm not paying anything today to drive around, right? But every time you turn on your water, every time you leave a light on in your room in the back of your mind, you're like, that's costing me money, right? We need to have more pricing. We need to understand how our cars are breaking the geometry and the climate of our communities and our planet. And this is gonna be an important model to break. Unfortunately, I don't know how we solve it, right? So this is the challenge for people younger than me, right? How do we figure out how to build places that reflect our values and that send the market signals to us that will save the planet, that will maintain the geometry that works for us, and will include the market signals that make sure that all of us make the right decisions to protect our community. So I wanna kinda end on this note. We shouldn't be talking about smart cities. Just like that Las Vegas thing went out, as we're not even technically in Las Vegas right now, I think we're in either paradise or, we're in paradise, right? Whatever, yeah, paradise, we're in paradise. Uh, it's smart regions, right? And we don't need to use information and communication technologies just to help the built environment. We want to improve outcomes, right? We want technology to work for us. And I think that future is possible. So thanks for listening. And are we doing questions or are we done? Okay, I'm happy to talk about, ask me anything, Reddit style, I'll, I'll talk about it. <laughs> All right. Uh, it seems like the, um, there's an incentive, because cities can't recruit the talent, they fail at completing their goals and industry can recruit the talent. And so it seems like industries are industry is better positioned to offer um, solutions as a service to cities. Is that fit well within your, your model or is that kind of counter to the direction that we should be going in terms of trying to bolster cities to be able to be self-sufficient in that regard without industry? It's a great point. No, it's a fan, and when, sorry, what's your name? Russell. Russell, thanks Russell, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, we're, we're gonna have to continue to contract more and more with the private sector. Um, you know, back to that study we did where we worked with local governments and we were like, how do you manage data? It's like, oh my gosh, you're having real trouble here. Um, what they constantly referenced was when they work closely with the private sector, it can be really helpful. The problem is um, there's this kind of consulting lingo about this of when, oftentimes when a consultant comes in or a contractor, they become temporary capacity. But when they're gone, that capacity is gone, right? So that person who knows how to build a data, relational database and how to apply it to a problem, they're gone. So how do we set up private sector collaborative models that help build capacity, leave it inside the, private, the public sector? So you're absolutely right. You know, no matter how nimble we make government, the private sector should always be more nimble than them. We've got to figure out how to create the, more of those feedback loops. So I, I think you're right. And then yeah. to kind of build off that, how does then government and cities and individuals navigate the negotiation of data in that? respect because I, I can see I can see private industry viewing the data with much more value than the city or government individual does and you know potentially you know setting the cities right up right, right for the taking so to speak yeah totally you probably, you probably have heard this phrase like data's the new oil right yeah yeah, yeah. Um, which is a little bit overblown but I mean it's it, it, it data is like a new kind of form not of energy but energy in the sense of it powers everything right Look, these are just my two cents, but the, my answer, my reply is almost like direct, which is un, not recommended, but like I think you're right, you're picking up on the challenge already, so I think the solution is we need a new form of governance infrastructure to manage data. 
not not the staff. That's kind of what I was getting at. Not the staff within government, but actually a whole new architecture for agencies in particular. So. Um, one idea that's going around that I'm a huge fan of is this idea of a, a public third party. So it's kind of like the Federal Reserve for data. Mm -hmm. Someone that you can put your public trust in um, that is owned by the government but not interfered with by the government, if, besides like some kind of board of governors or something. And they build quite literally the data lake, to use that jargon, right? That houses all this kind of data, right? And private sector can tap into it, public sector can tap into it. It's anonymized, right? It's encrypted, it's protected. Um, we're gonna have to figure out a solution like that, but we've got a long way to go. I mean, the exciting and fearful part of this is like, the, like back to that alarm clock example I gave, right? Like digital technology just 20 years ago meant something totally different than it does today. And it, I kind of buy that like, it is just part of the industrial revolution, but this feels like in like, software terms, we went from like little changes to like a whole new version number, right, of our economy. So it's gonna take a while to adjust to it. There's, yeah, hi. So you were just following up with sort of a talk about the public-private possibilities for data, but I understand that a subset of Google that's being headed up by one of Michael Bloomberg's chief, former chief of staff, or I forget exactly his position, are work, is working in a piece of Toronto to do like what you talked about with this idea of test pilots. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that specifically, but also about a sort of public-private partnership to actually work in modernizing cities. Yeah, it's a great question. So what you're getting at is, uh, it's called Sidewalk Toronto. Uh, it's an outfit called Sidewalk Labs, which is, you're exactly right, it is under, um, it's under Alphabet, the new, like, the new, like, Google, right? Google is now just their, like, kind of like search and internet division. Um, and uh, they have had a really tough time from a public relations standpoint on the privacy of the data. Because think about it, right? Like back to that, like not just first slide, but then the slide with like the three different pictures of like installing sensors. Like if you're gonna have sensors everywhere and a private company is the one managing them and maintaining it, all of a sudden they know everything about you. And oh, by the way, they, wanna, they don't only wanna provide your housing, so they're monitoring you inside their house. You're also using them for internet access, so they know everywhere you go on the internet, which by the way, whoever you use for internet, they know exactly what sites you're going to all the time. Uh, that's just, that's what you signed up for, actually. Uh, so the question is, and I don't have a good answer to, to your one, but I just want to put it, I think you're asking a good theoretical one. It's, it's actually not, it's really philosophical, right? Is do you trust companies with this information? And if you don't, well, are we willing to make the trade-off to not have what those companies provide? Because I would argue, I think most of us know that, that our telecommunications companies, including like a Sidewalk Labs when they launched that venture, knows exactly where we are all the time. I think we know that. Because, uh, I think, just think we know. I asked one of the classes when I was here, and I was like, yeah, I think, I think they know. Um, and they don't like it, but they don't sign off from the service either, right? We're going to have to adjust our perspective on what we expect from companies. And then back to, to Russell's question, right? How do we, how do we kind of manage the, the, the trust issues here, right? Who, <laughs> I use this phrase in another class. I love it on this, for this, for the old graphic novel term. It's like, who watches the watchman, right? If they're watching us, who watches them? And because we don't have an answer yet, that's one of the biggest um, civil liberties questions of our time. And it's not my specialty, so I don't have to answer it. <laughs> yeah. This is related, but do you see the sort of political philosophy of this country specifically as a barrier to um, making inroads and in having government use big data? So for example, like in Las Vegas, a lot of the casinos monitor everything you do. A lot of them have apps that monitor exactly where you are all the time. Um, and a lot of people don't have pro a problem with that, but at least in this country they would have a problem with the government doing something similar, um, even on a smaller scale. So are there um, sort of other, other, other countries that would be better uh, places for like a test pilot uh, version of this? Yeah, it's already happening. Um, there's this really cool example you all can look up on your own of uh, the London Tube installed uh, some, uh, I don't know if it was full on Wi-Fi or not, but it was like the, like the satellite receivers we all use, right? And so they could track via your DNS exactly where people were walking. It, it, they were like micro, so this is kind of like the different technology but the idea of how 5G will work, which is stringing, you know, right, the towers closer together. So they had all these, these uh, transponders closer together in the tube. 
and they could track exactly where people were walking. I mean exactly where they were walking through a tube station, right? Now, because everyone's watched in London, they actually have a really weird relationship where they kind of hate it, but they accept it. I think it's actually probably the next phase of like what's gonna happen in Toronto once probably the sky doesn't fall and everyone's like, yeah, it's, it is what it is, right? Um, but from that relationship, they allowed this to happen. And what they ended up being able to report out was, hey, by the way, public, <laughs> like this tube design actually could be a little bit better to help transfers and how people get in and out. Where folks with physical disabilities were having the most problems, right? So to me, it's about if we address, if we tackle the problems up front for bigger objectives, right, than just, hey, we're just monitoring you to monitor, I and mean, we're gonna monetize it like a casino, right? Hey, we're gonna monitor you because we, we wanna improve safety in this one place, right? And we're gonna make sure you have access to the data, maybe through this third party vendor, right? Or that's publicly owned, but it's not us, right? And then we're gonna tell you how we're gonna make your life better using that data. And I'm gonna lay it all out in front, what our hypothesis is, and then whether it's validated or not. I actually think Americans like government, right? Back to that local chart. I think they would trust their local government to do it. Um, and so we know places like London and the UK are doing it effectively. It's gonna be fascinating to watch which cities in the country are gonna do it well first. I would, I know you didn't ask exactly that. What I would think you should watch is what are the innovations coming out of Seattle, Washington DC, Portland, Chicago. You can kind of, you could imagine like five, 10 more markets I would add to that list. Places that are heavily digitalized. They are so wealthy that they really don't need to wait for the federal government to do things. And they're willing to experiment, right? Those places are gonna have innovations that are gonna, that are gonna hopefully let the like thousand flowers bloom across the country. All right. Hey, I think to build off that yeah. just briefly, there, you, you made it sound like there's a um, more trust in government than there are in private companies. And I think that, that kind of flips back and forth depending on who you're talking to. Because I think sure. the, the question for the longest time was we, are okay with our data being given out because it's a financial contract with the company, essentially, whereas with the government, there's no choice in that. I think that the illusion of choice is you know, becoming more and more apparent as, the, as technology takes hold, but uh, you and that, we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily choose um, you know, how we interact on social media if there's only one social media company and that sort of thing. But I think that the casino is tracking your actions in the casino is more palatable to more people than the government tracking your actions within a given city. Yeah, I think, I think first of all, you're right that it goes down to the individual, right? These things can change dramatically. Um, and yeah, I guess, to, I, I like your pushing on this. It's, it's less about that people trust government more or less relative to companies. I guess what I'm really suggesting is like, we need to have trust in our government on this. What's at stake is way too important um, from at least a built environment perspective. So hopefully we're gonna get it right. Last question. I don't want to cut anybody off. Please. So we're in Vegas. Um, let's pretend I'm the mayor of Vegas, and you're a policy expert. We don't have to pretend, but um, I want to know what you would prescribe to me. What? How do I get people out of their cars? Because as a citizen, for example, like I pay six hundred dollars a month just to say that I own the car, not even to drive it right. or to maintain it, but just to be able to say this is my car. And so you were talking about. Driving is ultimately cheaper than anything else, and when you really count the numbers down, it's not. I mean, right. I would pay, I don't know, $30 a month if I rode public transportation as opposed to $600, but you're right about that mental switch that people don't really think about it that way. So the question is, what can I, the mayor of Las Vegas, or uh, I don't know, do I partner with like a, a Save the Earth organization to try to run some kind of PR campaign and tell people, no, really, you guys, you're paying $600 a month. <laughs> right. You, pay, you know? Right, right, right. <laughs> you just highlight that fact. <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Well, I think, first of all, you bring up a good point. The, the, the challenge with cars isn't that people don't know they're expensive, it's that every time they use them, they think the price is zero. So it's like these huge fixed prices, these like bolt, right? Took it, take it in the shop, oh, I gotta change my brakes, right? Like that, they know that's coming, but the daily use, they, they don't feel it nearly as much. And that's a problem, whereas transit, it's like every time you feel it, right? You know what it costs, or biking, zero, right? Really nicely, yeah. Um, look, Las Vegas is, is in real trouble from a built environment. This is, you, you built it, 
you know, we've been talking to a few groups about it. You know, if you go to to Europe in particular, I just because I know that that you know the 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 texts on that more clearly, you see the, the old Roman roads, not like in between cities, although those two, in like a London and a Paris, not just Rome. Those are still the old Roman roads. Once you build a road, it pretty much does not go away because it's public right of way that they're going to continue to operate off of and all these buildings go up around it and it just starts to be, operate that way. What's great for Vegas, why they're in trouble I say is you're deep decades into this development pattern. It's going to take decades to potentially unwind it if you even un want to unwind it at all. But if you want to get people out of your car, you got to get denser, which that means trains on Maryland Parkway, it means trains on the strip, it means trains in other places, it means more, more expensive driving. I mean, and that's a tough sell to your population, right? So, Perfect. so Change good luck, Mayor. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay. Well, and, and you got to get denser, right? I mean, that's you got to build up. I mean, there's no other way around it. But look, again, just go to Los Angeles if you want to see what what this looks like, what the end game. I really mean it. People, urban planners from all over the world are now flying to places like Los Angeles and Sao Paulo to see the end game of just building roads. And it is not good, right? On top of the smog, like, like it just, it, ugh. So look, like pick your poison, right? You don't like riding trains, it's not as convenient, but if you wanna breathe good air and you wanna make sure your economy stays competitive and you're not stuck in your car for two and a half hours, you know? New York's bigger than LA and they have better travel habits, right? It tells you something, you know? Good luck, Mayor. Yeah. <laughs> right. I always hate to end the Q&A, but I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you, sir, for Thank your you. presentation. <clears throat> Thank you all for your great questions and your attendance. If you have time, we'll be here next week. Or one week from now, we'll continue actually a little bit on the built environment. Our colleague Andre Perry will be out from Brookings and he'll talk about housing, house prices, access to housing through the lens of race. He has some, I think, fascinating new data to tell us about all that. So please join us in a week. Thanks a lot. Thank